My auntie asked me recently if I could make her some large driveway gates out of some salvaged timber that she had laying around. These are some old garage doors which I had to cut in half to get inside my vehicle and they are made up of decking boards on a frame of 4x2s and 3x2s. And I wasn't sure if this timber would actually be in reusable condition or not so the first job was to remove all of the hardware and take out hundreds of screws and see if I could get it all apart without too much damage. Fortunately no glue had been used but unfortunately silicon had been used between each decking board and I'll have to deal with that later. With all of the screws removed, even the really stubborn ones, it was a pretty good haul of timber in the end, and a little bit of firewood too which is that pile on the right. And first I need to get rid of that silicon, and a combination of both peeling and scraping it off did work but it was time consuming so eventually I decided it would be easier just to rip some fresh clean edges on each board at the table saw. I'm also going to cut clean ends on the boards too and then cut everything to length. For the joinery I'm going to use the router to cut some mortises so here I'm marking up where I want to make my cuts and I mark up a centre line which I can use to line up the tip of my router bit. It's an 8mm spiral up cut bit that I have fitted and I started by making a plunge cut at both the start and end points and then I can remove all of the material in between, lowering the bit by a few millimetres each time I make a pass. Regular viewers of the channel will know that I'm not a big fan of using routers, but I'm trying to push myself to try new things. Okay, so that didn't go too badly, but there's room for improvement. So you can see that when I got to this end, the router had a tendency to kind of twist inwards a little bit, so it hasn't made for a perfect mortise. But I think that should be an easy fix. I just need to extend the fence on my edge guide and I'll just do that by screwing on a straight piece of timber. Adding this piece of MDF to the fence made things a lot easier. And once I'd made all of the cuts to the ends of the rails, I can use the same process again to cut the mortises in the edges of the legs of the frames. As I've exposed new timber at the edges, I'm going to add some wood preserver which will help protect the timber from wood boring insects and rot. Even though these boards are tannalised or pressure treated, which is why they have a green tint to them, that treatment doesn't penetrate all of the way into the centre of the material. I also like to soak the end grain in the preserver too, it really drinks a lot of it up, and I'll leave a link to the stuff that I'm using in the description box below. I found this old piece of sapili from an old door which I'm going to use to make floating tenons. I'm ripping it in half to give me more material and then I cut it to width and then I use the thicknesser to get it down to 8mm to fit nicely in my mortises. And then I can shape the edges round with a block plane and I can check they fit nice and snug and these look perfect. To make the glue up easier and hopefully less stressful, I decided to glue in one side of the tenons first before I assemble anything. I like using polyurethane glue for exterior situations and I'll leave a link to what I'm using here below too. After an hour or so the glue has cured and I can start laying out the frames ready for the glue up. These gates are going to be 1875mm wide so I don't have any clamps long enough and I'm going to have to double up the clamps that I do have to get each rail fitted. And then measuring corner to corner I can check that it's square and it all looks good. Okay, so time to talk about bracing these gates. And the first thing I would say is that ideally I wouldn't have had this central rail here at all but the reason I included it in the design is because the boards that I've got to work with aren't long enough to span diagonally. So the central rail is going to allow me to brace the gate in two pieces, the bottom half and the top half. If you can imagine for this particular gate that this side is the hinge side then this is the direction that the braces need to run and ideally I'd want this top rail bearing against this leg of the gate 
rather than the bottom rail. That would be the best option for maximum strength. But if the angle of this brace goes beyond 45 degrees, you start to lose a lot of strength. Really, it needs to be at 45 degrees or even steeper than that. So what I think I'm going to do is run the brace at 45 degrees and make two cuts here and here just to make sure that this leg is enforcing the brace as well as the bottom rail. Then on the center rail, rather than make a straight cut like this, I think what I'm going to do is angle this cut upwards like this, make another cut something like this, and then actually cut a housing in the center rail to accommodate that brace. And that just means that the brace has something solid to push against, and that's going to make it really rigid. First, I cut the end that's going to push into the corner. And then I'm going to mark up a straight line where it meets the center rail, just for reference. I can then use the speed square offered up to that line to pivot and I'm going to go beyond 45 degrees to 55 degrees and then I mark a line. I can get that cut first. And then with the mitosaur set back to 90 degrees, I can just cut away the end. Then I can use that as a template to mark up the housing that I'm going to need to cut. And I'm going to use the jigsaw for that. Obviously not a tool that would be conventionally used in any form of joinery, but actually with the right blade fitted, I can make the cut plenty accurate enough. And I'm making sure to cut on the inside of the line as I can always remove more material if needed. I want to make sure it's a nice tight fit to help support the rail and keep the gate nice and rigid. The first one fitted okay, there was a bit of a gap, but it's actually tight where it matters, meaning it's going to support that rail nicely. Then it's the same process again for the top brace, which I want to line up just by eye with the bottom brace. With everything cut and fitting nicely, I treat the ends again and then get ready for gluing them in place, again with polyurethane glue, and I use a screw just to hold everything in place while the glue dries. At the bottom corner I just had to rely on glue as there was no easy way to get a screw in there. After a bit of filling and sanding, the frames are complete. Now onto cladding them. I bought these 16mm tongue and groove boards from a local shed and fencing company. These aren't pressure treated unfortunately so I'm going to treat them all with my preserver and get the ends soaked too. And you can see just how much it soaks up just after an hour or so. I'm laying out the boards on top of the frame first just to check the spacing of the boards will be okay as I don't want to get to the end and then find out I need a really thin piece but it looked like I could pretty much just remove the tongue and grooves from the boards at each end which is good so that's what I did. Each board gets glued and nailed at the top, middle and bottom and I used two 40mm galvanised nails in each fixing point. I've fitted this type of cladding in the past using one nail or screw at each point to allow the boards to move more and two nails or screws at each point, but two with glue seems to work best. The glue with two nails method seems to reduce the amount that each board can expand and contract slightly, but not to a point where it creates any issues. I still leave a decent expansion gap between each board though, about two or three millimeters, especially here because these boards are so dry so they will probably swell a bit in the winter. This was quite a lot of nailing to do by hand, but I couldn't use my framing nailer because I don't think you can get those nails any shorter than 50 millimeters. And ideally I needed about 35 mil. Every so often I just want to measure at the top and bottom just to check that I'm not fitting them skewed in one way or the other. And if I notice it's out slightly, I can compensate with the next few boards to get it straightened out. I can then use the track saw to trim off the tongue on the last board and a block plane to get it flush. And the same for the ends too. I've got some of this dark oak stain to apply which is going to blend in the new wood with the old. This Ron Seal stuff covered pretty well. I was impressed with it. I'll leave a link to this in the description box too. Two coats in total, job done. 
And finally, I picked up these capping rails at my local timber yard. These will help shed the water off the top of the gates, and I'm just nailing them on, no glue here, so that they are easy to replace when needed. If you're wondering why this gate here looks smaller, that's because it is smaller. I actually made three gates in this video, two large and one small, all for the same driveway. This smaller gate was built pretty much in the same way, but without a centre rail. As for this one, I had enough length on the timber to brace it in one piece. So I made these gates for my auntie to replace some existing ones that have dropped and sagged over time because they were braced incorrectly. And fitting the new gates isn't going to be a straightforward job for reasons which I'll talk about in the next video as there are a few complications that I'll need to contend with so it should be an interesting one. I lost count of how many hours this project took because I was doing it in between some other projects but it definitely took longer than I expected and it was a good reminder that working on big unwieldy objects is a real challenge even with a fairly large workspace like I am lucky to have here. As an example, for the larger two gates, whenever I needed to turn them over to apply stain to the other side, I had to get my wife to help me. It's not so much the weight of them, but the size and how unwieldy they are, so I think I definitely owe her a few favours now. In terms of the total cost for this job, I haven't yet figured it out to be honest, but I will be putting a full breakdown of the job costs on my Patreon and YouTube channel membership pages, so if you're interested to see those, that's where they'll be. But obviously using salvaged timber for the frames made for a pretty substantial saving. Perhaps I'll put a comparison together for what it would have cost using new decking boards for the frame versus salvaged. That could be interesting. Anyway, please subscribe to the channel for more videos if you'd like to help support the channel, plus get early access to the videos, exclusive content, free project plans and cut lists, and a name credit at the end of my videos. You'll find links to my Patreon and YouTube channel membership in the description box below. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.